Hey everybody, it's Sebastian Blanco with Inside EVs here at the um, Battery Show Oops, 2017. We are at the Tank 2 booth, and maybe you've heard about it, the idea that you can basically refill your car with these little nuggets instead of, um, you know, waiting for a charge. So we're going to speak with uh, CEO Bert Holtables in a second here. He's busy for a second, but he's going to tell us what it is that we're looking at, and he's just done this presentation many times, so we're asking him to do it one more time. So Bert, what's, what are we looking at here? All right, hey, okay. So Bert from Tank2, I'm CEO. We make the world's smartest and best batteries for electric cars and other applications. So our cells, you know, they're about this long, an inch and a half approximately. They look like an egg. They have six contacts on the outside, and the electrochemically active stuff that actually makes the power is in there. So what you do with these things is that instead of you know, building a battery pack with cylindrical cells or, or uh, uh, prismatic cells, you actually just take a bunch of those and you throw them together in a container like this. These cells, they touch one another completely randomly. And uh, what they do is because they have the ability to detect their neighbors, so the proximity to their neighbors, so they draw a dimension, three dimensional string cells, uh, a connection, uh, possibly having a negative terminal that is connected to a fan. So, and what it does here is so that he gives the command for these cells to actually wire themselves, sell themselves to wire themselves up in uh, uh, in series, and uh, it will power this fan. So, what you can see here is that this is essentially the, the the fundamental building block for all the solutions that we provide. We go from this minimum tube with how many? Twelve cells, fourteen cells, something like that. Seventeen cells all the way up to you know a battery pack for a bus which might have 20 or 30 thousand cells so it's a modular system that can scale essentially infinitely so if you do a close-up so that uh, the cells actually so that this is uh, for optical purposes, but also for R&D, so they have indicators that indicate what state they are in. So you see that they change from color when they are during discovery, during the discovery process, when the actual system is trying to figure out which cells are in there. Uh, then it draws a three-dimensional map of the system to see what options we have for wiring them up. And then when they start delivering power, uh, so then, then you can see that as well. So that, that actually helps for explaining how the purpose works. So sure. engineers that want to look into this in detail. Uh, they can uh, they can actually you know see that okay you know this cell is over there it has a not so perfect orientation what's going to happen with it so these tools that we have available for them for their analysis they can really you know go all the way and, and uh, until they understand the system in the greatest possible detail really dig in they can dig it. until there's <coughs> and you said more to dig. you'll have some sort of announcement next year as far as working with an automaker working with someone who makes vehicles is that what I heard during your, your talk. That's right. So that uh, we are currently building a very interesting pilot project. So uh, and, and it, it, it has four wheels <laughs> and it moves very nicely. So it will be powered with these string cells. And uh, but we hope actually in the meantime, you know, that we get a bunch of other pilot customers because we do not want to focus specifically on passenger vehicles. Mm -hmm. So you know, anything that uses electricity and anything that moves or not necessarily not moves. So we yeah. want to hear from you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. This is the, the, the chemistry that is already being in, used in many other applications, but the ability to kind of, you know, rearrange them differently, constantly, at all times, it allows you to use different type of cells, cells of varying performance levels, cells that are sensitive for high heat, for low heat, mm -hmm. and of course, you know, the ability <coughs> to swap the cells. So for certain applications where the quick turnaround time is necessary, it's, it's a great benefit. So right. we offer flexibility, uh, and definitely, you know, the cost to bring down, uh, the, the, or bring down the cost of electric traction by, you know, at least a factor of two, maybe even a factor of three. So an electric ambulance, that was never going to be a thing before. If you have to wait 40 minutes to charge, mm -hmm. we can do that. We can do certain things in standby power, which no other solution allows. And then, you know, that having fleet operations where you do not have buses or delivery trucks over dimensioned with the cost associated with it, that's no longer necessary. You just give the, 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 the vehicles the capacity that they need. And at the end of the day, what matters is that the one that pays the bill 
He wants to have the solution that delivers the best service at the lowest price, and that's only possible with a flexible battery mm -hmm. solution. And so the idea being that if you have a, a, a fleet of taxis, let's say, and this taxi driver is going to drive for maybe four hours today, he needs this many kilowatt hours of capacity, whereas that driver is going to go out for 10 hours, so he would just get more of these little sell eggs in his battery in his EV than the other driver. Exactly. You know, so that some are of the view that the amount of sales that you should have in your vehicle is as many as you need to get to your next P break. Yeah. Right? So okay, that's a point of view. In other uh, applications it might be so that you just want to dimension for, for, for liability so that you have a big buffer. So the point is that right now somebody that makes operational decisions that designs routes that designs plans how their mm -hmm. vehicles are being used they do not essentially have any flexibility you want somebody to be able to say that okay that bus is going to do this route today and it needs this amount of cells and when that flexibility exists operations become much more efficient what is so over here we have sort of a you know a Car not cartoony, but sort of futuristic idea of what it would look like. What do you imagine it actually looks like when they are taking these things in or out of the of the cell? What is what does that process look like? Right. So it spans the entire spectrum, right? So that we work with a German company called Zeppelin in Friedrichshafen. So they are a big global automation giant. So they are experts in solid bulk handling. They have built a swap station which is fully automatic. With this technology, you can just throw them together. All the new cells will work together just happily. Cells that are of good performance will work fine with cells that have eroded performance. And you can make sure that your customer's needs, your fleet operation needs, your operational profile can be met at all times. So uh, we have here the simplest possible demonstration unit that uh, you can have. It's a transparent tube. It has a bunch of these uh, string cells in there. So what they do is, like I said earlier, so they just figure out which cells they are connected to at random, and then they determine which of these terminals should be positive and negative. So when that process is completed, uh, they'll, drive, they'll drive this big fan. This fan, uh, it is just a dummy load, no trickery involved. And uh, just think what this can do for your application. So for anybody here that has an application that uses electrical power, you know, cars, power tools, standby power, uh, electric vehicles, trucks, hovercrafts, military applications, you know, anything like that, we would like to do a pilot with you because the things that this can do for you, the flexibility that we can provide and the cost savings, we think that nobody else in the industry can match them. All right, thank you, shows uh, the magic that has happened in the meantime. So I really invite you guys to actually come to take a look at it because this is the most uh, stripped down demonstration that you can do. So there's no power electronics involved. The only thing what you have is just the cells, the tube, and a wire connected to the fan. So anybody that tries to poke holes in the system, you know, this is the opportunity to do so because a few of you guys already have come by and have said that, actually, I don't really believe that this works. Well, all right, I think it actually does work. So, and, and anybody that can have some ideas about how this can be improved, we have a good uh, bonus program in place to talk to them. Charging is actually a good question, so that it is a battery pack in the end of the day, after all, right? So that for most applications, uh, this device, the battery pack, which can come in any shape or form, by the way, so it can be charged from the wall, just through a cord. So, however, what you can do is that for certain very critical applications, say that you run an ambulance service, and Supercharging nowadays is being defined as waiting 30 or 40 minutes at 130 kilowatt hour charger. But uh, an ambulance that has to wait 30 minutes in a supercharger, that is still pretty bad marketing. So what we suggest is to, for really critical applications that you actually have an onboard charging device, which is nothing else than a hopper or a, a plastic container or a silo, in which the discharged cells are pumped on top, and as the, uh, the, the, the silo is being depleted from the bottom with freshly charged cells, those cells actually get charged on the go. So you get a constantly... So these cells at this point in time, they're actually manufactured at uh, a cell phone assembly line run by Nokia, which uh, is not as successful as it used to be, but it means that there's a lot of capacity available in those factories. So these things they used to churn out smartphones, now they are churning out our cells. So pretty much, you know, 
unlimited capacity with with a little bit of a uh, little bit of warning so maybe with two or three months of warm-up time 100 million cells could be provided any other questions The pilot case which we have going right now, so we're in pilot stage, right? So that's that's where we are. So we have uh, approximately seven operational cases which are of sufficient size and strength that they can be considered representative for, a, say, an automotive type of environment. We're looking for more, specifically in the non-automotive environment. So anybody that has, you know, an industrial application and would like to try this, we definitely would want to hear from you. Uh, in the beginning of next year, uh, we're going to do an announcement with uh, one of the major players about the incorporation of, this, of their technology in uh, consumer passenger vehicles. So, we're ready to fly. Anybody that wants to have some of these cells in their vehicles, please come to talk to us. Any other questions? Energy density. Energy density, right. So, the thing about uh, being at the battery show and saying that battery chemistry isn't actually a real differentiator is usually a bad way to get your stuff sold. But the reality is, is that the battery chemistry, what we use, is not anything special. So we buy it from the open market. So depending on actually the requirements of your application, it can be about maybe uh, if there's cross pressure, you get a different kind of answer than if you, for example, like to have resistance against high temperature or number of cycle time. So the, the result is that the densities that we provide are pretty much on par what you get from, 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 from other solutions. So the order of magnitude is a little bit under 200 watt hours uh, per liter volumetrically and uh, about the same number uh, gravimetrically. So, but things can be tuned, right? So that if your price sensitivity is low, we can crank it up. If your price sensitivity uh, is high, then we could, there's some other things that we can do. But unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, uh, that is not a different shape. Sure. Are you doing any work with standardization on the communications between the cells and, and is the main communications taking place in the, in the big unit or just messages to the individual cells? That's actually a good question. So the question was about if we are active with any kind of standardization bodies to make sure that uh, uh, this works with other systems and whether or not the cells are communicating uh, with other units in the system. Well, two things. So first of all, so that our main interfaces on system level are standards compliant. So the messaging bus is TAN based. So integrating into pretty much anything that is industry standard is not a problem. Also about the communication between the cells and the rest of the system. So uh, what we do is that we publish uh, the protocols that are used. So and they're open for anybody to use royalty free. So this is not something that we consider to be a necessary control point, and we think that the, benefit, that the business benefits uh, if people participate in that. So that any information that is necessary for you to integrate into your product, into your business, uh, is available upon request.